Welcome to the Basement Roundtable Discussion. I'm Benjamin Denniston. I'm joined with Peter Martinson, Ouyang Tang, and Sky Shields, all of the LaRouche Pack Basement team. And what we're going to discuss today it involves, it comes out of the commitment of LaRouche Pack and the basement team to committing mankind to a Moon Mars colonization program to actually further manned space exploration and committing to construction of the first permanent settlements both on the moon and Mars as uh, the scientific and technological mission for basically our generation to commit over the next century. And in taking up a commitment to that mission, uh, what has come up is basically this pushes the frontiers of, you could say, a whole array, if not every field of modern science. And so what has come up for the basement science team is taking up those challenges. What are the frontiers of science that are now being put on the table and uh, call for new investigations and solutions as required by this Moon Mars space colonization program? And so to begin the discussion today, um, Sky, I know we've been discussing recently that one thing that comes up immediately is you have these what are presently often referred to as undefinables in physics of space, time, sometimes mass. And you've been emphasizing recently that we're going to need to rethink these concepts to have the right understanding to approach this mission we're discussing here. Mm -hmm. And with the work we've done thus far in the basement, uh, people have seen a, a lot of the discussion, the series of papers that the three of us have put out. Right. Um, uh, we've a recent one by Megan Roulard on the discussion of the use of, of the unique use of isotopes by living processes. Uh, we're in a position right now to completely redefine those, the question of these quantities of space, time, and, and matter. These things mm -hmm. which up until now from the standpoint of, of, of abiotic physics, uh, the science to which the other sciences were supposed to be able to be reduced, were considered to be not capable of a definition, except perhaps in terms of you had a, you had an internal circle of definitions. You had all these things, force, etc., uh, different quantities which were capable of being reduced down to these things: space, time, matter. Matter itself was capable of being reduced to space and time, but those were considered to be themselves undefinable, not discussed. Well, what is space? What is time? It's just where things are happening. Uh, there was some flexibility introduced into the uh, the the notion around Einstein's work with special relativity and general relativity, which created the idea that, that these things we call space and time were somehow were were not immutable, that they were they were they were subject to some kind of of direct action, to some kind of change, alteration, uh, and which hinted back at an earlier tradition that had existed before the takeover that was represented by, by Descartes and Newton, the earlier tradition of, of Leibniz, and then earlier than that, uh, Kepler, Cusa, and the Pythagoreans, the Platonic tradition, <clears throat> which recognized that there was no such thing, that these, these ideas, that, which didn't need the fiction of an absolute space or an absolute time, and recognized that you had what you had was you actually had the uh, relationship between different types of action. And from those relationships, you could construct, you could derive a certain kind of lawfulness. Later on, this crutch was introduced in the form of Cartesianism, Newtonianism, which wasn't able to, wasn't able, capable of, of, which destroyed people's ability to conceive of the universe as it actually existed and said cast everything against this backdrop of, of, of fiction called space and time. And in order to fill the thing out, had to introduce a fiction called, called mass as it's typically treated. Right now, with the work we're doing in the biological sciences and the cognitive sciences, we're in a position to finally break that wide open again and to begin to reapproach these things as, as, as not as a priori given quantities or, or, or concepts you simply have to have to accept, 
but it's something that's derivable from from actual actual things that have an actual ontological existence. And you said so you said that because what seems unique is that you're bringing up here is approaching it from the standpoint of the biological investigations. So you'd say that a lot of these fictional concepts are arising from the attempt to understand science and these things just from the standpoint of abiotic processes. Yeah, we're in a position right now. I mean, it's in a, a, probably a fruitful way to, to think about some of these things is that you can start to approach certain quantities as invariants under a certain set of actions. You've got a certain set of changes and operations that can take place. And then while you're looking at all these, and those are the things that actually exist. They're irreducible. There's some type of change, some type of action. You're taking a whole set of those, and you start to recognize that there are quantities within those actions that relative to those actions don't change. I'll give you an example. For the, the whole body of, of operations that exist in chemistry, in physical chemistry, uh, Lavoisier recognizes that as you're doing every, you would take every possible reaction you could think of, every possible set of combination, of decomposition, etc. Uh, those constitute a space of possible activity. Everywhere in that space, there's a quantity called mass which stays the same. That gives you, hmm. you from there you're getting an idea of mass not as, uh, not as a mathematical fiction, but as an invariant within a certain phase space, the phase space of, of, of chemistry. Now, this is, it's useful, obviously, when you're doing this, if you've got, when you recognize that kind of invariant on the basis of those kinds of symmetries, you're capable of formulating conservation laws. So in that case, you get the conservation of mass. Uh, with a whole set of other operations, physical and thermodynamic operations, you get conservation of energy. With the expanded set of operations you got around uh, Einstein's work on, on special, special relativity, you can extend that to uh, a broader concept of the conservation of, of, of matter energy, matter and energy. But as you're extending, as you're broadening the space in which you're operating, you're constantly broadening the, you're changing the symmetries of that space. And you're changing your ability to look at these things, these quantities that are projected down. Hmm. With respect to a very limited set of operations, things like the th quantities we call space, time, space, time, seems to be conserved. But then when you broaden your space to include biological phenomena, this is what Vernadsky does, you suddenly realize that in that broader phase space, which includes the biological as a distinct set of properties, something not reducible to the abiotic, in that space suddenly you no longer have, that thing you call time is no longer an invariant. Suddenly you've got a set of things that in a lower phase space were all lumped together as time, but in this case are all distinct. Hmm. And, you know, Vernadsky recognizes in that what will be a useful tool for us coming soon, which is this concept of the heterogeneity of time, hmm. which is something we'll be clarifying in, in some upcoming, upcoming works. So it seems like the crucial thing is getting away from the idea of starting from the standpoint of these indefinables and trying to understand everything from that standpoint, approaching these physical investigations and identifying what are these invariants and what are these properties that exist from the standpoint of the physical investigations? Because like you said with Vernadsky, he doesn't assume that you can reduce life and living processes down to the same abiotic processes. But he starts that that exists as its own principle in the universe. You have to recognize and start from then define the properties from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. These things are secondary. Mm -hmm. They're not. I mean, they may be useful. I mean, this is... These are there's, there's certain things that you can you derive on the basis of the space in which you're operating, and they, they could be useful. They could be useful concepts in a limited way, but if you take those concepts now and you mm. use them to discuss a higher space, you've limited the conclusions you're capable of drawing to the space that you had derived those concepts from in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the concepts of space, time, and matter as they exist, as they're defined in order to operate in the abiotic, will not allow you to make any truthful statement about the biotic or the cognitive. Hmm. And so to be able to really approach these areas is call, calls for a complete redefinition, a complete reapproach to all of these. Right. So that's obviously what we're taking up with this project. Because I know, Ouyang, you had written a paper, and you're taking up some of these biological questions. Because one thing that comes up very quickly, obviously, in the mankind space exploration is 
there's a lot we don't know about how living organisms such as ourselves are going to react to being in interplanetary space or being on another body for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. And now one, one thing you take up in your paper that you've looked at is what are, what actually getting at what are the, what are the radiation, electromagnetic, electrical, different energetic phenomena that are involved in life processes. Mm-hmm. And because it's a question that we do have a very unique environment here on Earth that's different than interplanetary space, that's different on the moon or on Mars, for example. And so we're taking it as an open question as to what is going to be required in terms of creating the right type of energetic and radiation environment, for maybe lack of a better term, to actually sustain life on these different worlds. Right. I mean, posing the question for uh, space travel, you know, up till now, most of the challenges of... uh at least on the on the biological side, on you know you m- might call it space physiology, um, has still mostly been concerned with just sort of keeping people alive, you know, keep, keeping the the right uh, temperature, um, the right pressure, uh, <clears throat> and certain things that we still on that on that level uh, there are still you know challenges to be solved. What happens uh, biochemically uh, in space? But it is an incomplete picture. Um, even if some of those, and, and what we're finding is that trying to solve problems strictly in those terms of reference, uh, is, you've reached a limit. So recognizing that organisms uh, developed as part of a, a as, as Vernadsky emphasizes, a, a unified process of development within the Earth, uh, on the Earth, in combination with the the sun and other uh, cosmic uh, radiation and other uh, uh, energetic forces, hones the thinking to realize that there's a lot that's built in to the organism which expresses the biosphere as a whole. And the biosphere as a whole contains what you might say is a whole array of unseen, whether you call them forces or principles, uh, which are active even if we're not conscious of them. And one of the things, uh, really the prime driver, I would say, even in the history of the way a lot of these investigations came about, for focusing attention on some of these unseen elements, uh, in particular, as you mentioned, uh, the role of electromagnetic radiation. Um, Even just looking at the role, for example, of the Earth's magnetic field, which is constantly changing, uh, that itself, the structure of the Earth's magnetic field, we still have a long way to go in understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, and, that, and the first measurements, the first real rigorous measurements of that were already being made by Gauss in the 1800s. So, um, but that those, uh, the, so really the first thing that really focused attention on the importance and the necessity of these really was the advent of the space age. And as you mentioned, um, you know, if you take, a, you can look at a, a, at a series of transformations as you get farther and farther from the surface of the planet, um, in which these characteristics are constantly changing. And, uh, you know, not to speak of when you're on the moon or on Mars. And so, uh, the, most of the work that has been done is focused on a kind of a simplistic model that you have a lot of bad radiation that's, that's going to be showering the astronauts and there's got to be a way to shield them from that. Right, uh, but it's a little bit presumptuous to assume that we know what that what those characteristics are that you're, uh, you know, suppose that you're shielding them from that that the investigation still of what regulatory role radiations play in uh, biological processes. Right. Um, what the fundamental nature of these radiations are is something that we're you know far from understanding. Because you've been from your paper, I saw you've been digging into some. A lot of experimental work that seems like it's been either pushed to the side or kind of fallen off, showing what you're, it seems like what you're trying to say here that we have to get away from the idea of radiations just as in terms of space travel as a threat to from bombarding well, yeah, people to looking at like from the work of Gervich, Frank right. Brown, different people looking at how life actually depends upon and utilizes these different radiations. Yeah, as opposed to looking at it as sort of an unwanted, you know, external intruder mm-hmm. that all of a sudden no, we realize there's another element of hostility um, you know as you as you leave the earth 
uh, really taking it back to Vernadsky's approach, uh, which is to say, again, starting from the, uh, from the idea that uh, living processes represent a unique phase space, a unique physical phase space. Um, as Sky mentioned, a heterogeneous phase space, that, that you have uh, physical space-time is not homogeneous. Um, you know, some of his criticism of, uh, of the way that certain people were treating what Einstein had done was to, you know, was to say that they're trying to create a homogeneous physical space-time without recognizing that living organisms, different species even, have unique physical space-time characteristics. Um, and that's, uh, so, but to take this broad view that there's going to, that, that you have to investigate the characteristics of those unique experimental domains that you have access to um, without presuming that you know exactly what are the constituents that supposedly compose them. That uh, then it opens the mind, it opens you up to allowing for the uh, existence of weak forces, these very weak electromagnetic forces, weak being, being defined from the standpoint of your instrumentation and not necessarily their effect mm -hmm. in biology. And so as Gervich showed, you have a very low level in terms of the, you know, uh, measure, the, the measurements that you can make of certain kind of radiation involved in cell, cell functions and cell metabolism. Um, and as other people following on that showed, you have very weak uh, background and, and uh, other, you know, uh, electromagnetic effects that influence the behavior and the vital activity of organisms. But again, weak from the standpoint of our measurements and not weak from the standpoint of what their actual role is, which we still don't know. There's just mm -hmm. a lot of um, sort of unsorted empirical evidence. The point being it's just a fundamental part of life that we don't seem to fully understand. Right. And the, and the only way we're going to really be able to, to bring order to this huge uh, mass of experimental work is to focus it around specific mission, um, uh, specific mission orientation. I mean, that is mm -hmm. a real practical side of, of the necessity for, say, colonizing the moon, the necessity for long-term human habitation in space, the necessity for long-term agriculture in space. Hmm. And that is going gonna, is gonna to bring a lot of focus to specifically and prioritize what specific questions need to be answered in, in terms of uh, how these unique effects actually act and how we can control them. Mm -hmm. and it seems like that's the way you'd want to pose it. I mean, this, is, it, this seems like one of the places where we're most clearly crippled by all the terminology that's been borrowed from physics in an attempt to apply in this area. Right. Because yeah, the, the very concept, when people think of radiation... When they think of you know an astronaut or an organism being quote unquote exposed to radiation in space, you picture so you've got this little organism here on Earth, you transplant it. It's the same thing somewhere out quote unquote in space, mm -hmm. and it's hit by things coming from outside of it. Right. But it's not the case. This thing's always being, it's always in a radio a radioactive environment here on Earth. Mm -hmm. It's different there. Tra you can't transplant that thing from where it is to somewhere else simply any more than you can just transplant you know, your arm from off your body to the center of the table there, <laughs> right. right? It doesn't just exist as an independent thing. It's part of a process. Mm -hmm. If you want the arm to move, you've got to figure out how to restructure the whole process so it can be there. And the same thing, if you're talking about moving an organism from place to place, you know, mm. again, I'll put it in quotes, in space, because it's really not space. You're moving it in this, in this a fluid, really, an ocean. There's an ocean of radiation. There's an ocean of of all, all these flowing, constantly changing phenomena of which that thing is a part, motion in that thing requires a question of reorganizing the whole process, is what you really mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's another way you can view, the real way to view building a quote-unquote life support system for the human species is you're talking about you're recreating all the elements of the, the biosphere, all the elements mm -hmm. of the process of which it's a part, and extending that to the places you want the, the organism yeah. to be. And I think... Um, I think an important consideration in that is the fact that a lot of the um, elements of the physical environment of the biosphere itself uh, is a product of life. That you, you do have uh, a certain, you know, you, you might call it a principle of infrastructure in which living organisms, you know, we say what infrastructure for human economy is the production of the, the preconditions 
for the future means of existence of your society. Um, and I think in a certain analogous way, you have that in the biosphere, uh, the creation of the ozone layer. I mean, first of all, the creation of the oxygen atmosphere, the ozone layer. Um, and I would say, my, my inclination is to say increasing uh, the evidence points to the fact that, the, that living organisms are uh, responsible, at least in some degree, for the creation of the magnetic field of the Earth, hmm. which, as, is, as many people discuss, is, is important for, um, I would say, not just shielding the Earth from external radiation, but structuring it. Um, because mm -hmm. in certain cases, it's actually uh, bringing, <laughs> it's uh, as like the Van Allen belt show, you know, it's, it's uh, in one sense, it's, it's creating new fields of radiation. It's helping to create new fields of radiation. Hmm. Um, so the fact that that's an, an imminent part of the biosphere itself, that, you know, it's not that you have um, either the, the mold hypothesis, as you've called it, you know, you have a rock and mold grows on it, right. and that's your, your view of life in the biosphere, or as someone else put it, the chia pet hypothesis, <laughs> you know, um, that these things are integrated in a way which has not really been assimilated by, uh, by science uh, outside of Vernadsky hmm. and his school of thought. And I think that's really the approach to take now with the benefit of 60 some odd years of, of new experimental work and, you know, the possibility for actually traveling in space. Right. I mean, the implications, I think, are just exciting if even hard to I mean I don't think we can really even fully know when in solving some of these questions I mean I think it's important just to point out that we don't even really know how this will revolutionize the way we live in terms of medical technology uh, diseases all these different things we're talking about making getting a whole new understanding of the way life and living processes operate by seeing how we're actually existing within this unique environment of the biosphere and then it's important to point out, I think, that we know that in some way or another it's going to completely revolutionize how we are able to operate and exist here on Earth and sustain ourselves and our society. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just keeps coming up. Because mm -hmm. you're talking about learning more about how we exist as right. a species. That can't, I mean, that does transform what you're doing here right. on Earth, right? People have this idea, well, will there be some spillover trickle from what you're doing you know, that might affect life here on Earth. And that's frankly just a bullshit way of phrasing the question. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about with this kind of investigation, with figuring out how to extend man's ability to survive off of Earth, is learning out how to learning how to how to take conscious control over man's survival, over man's over man's life here on Earth. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's not something that, you know, might have some spillover effect right. at some point. Another area that's come up in all this investigation, I think it's very exciting it's from the work you did, Peter, in the article you wrote. Because you took up, in your article, you started by taking up the question of this, I mean, most of our viewers are probably familiar in some degree or another with this so-called wave particle paradox, which came out towards the beginning of the 20th century, looking at what exactly, new questions of what exactly is energy, what exactly is matter, how do they interrelate, what is the connection between these things, which we thought we understood before, but then this new experimental work uh, that began to come out around the time of Einstein and different people really showed there's a much higher connection, which I think, still think we don't fully understand. But one thing that you pose in your paper, and going back to the discussion we've had so far, is you say that the crucial thing that you seem to add is that we have to not just, again, look at this from the standpoint of abiotic processes and abiotic experiments, but then approach these questions from the standpoint of living matter as well. Yeah, well, this is one of the problems that <clears throat> I mean, Sky's bringing up. It's not going to be solved if you look at simple abiotic physics, because no matter where you look, you're going to run into a problem where one experiment you do is going to tell you that really we're dealing with fundamental particles of the universe. In another experimental context, you're going to see that you're actually dealing with some type of wave phenomena. Um, Neither of them are totally true, but um, also not, neither concept fully, uh, fully embodies the experimental results that you're getting. But no matter what you do, if you're dealing specifically with only abiotic physics, you'll still have the same paradoxes. Hmm. But what, what became clear to me early on when we were looking at the issue of how does um, electromagnetic radiation and cosmic rays and <clears throat> the general... Um, 
energetic phenomena interacting with life, how does all that stuff interact with the development of life on the Earth in terms of the evolutionary development over long periods of time and in terms of immediate development like in the development of the embryo or the regeneration of lost limbs, regulation, just the formation of um, the bodies of organisms, it became clear that the, uh, the wave particle thing is inherent in uh, living processes. Like if you just take um, like evolution over long, over long times as an example, uh, you always see that it's never, you know, we're, we're stuck with this uh, essentially a dead concept of Darwinian, Darwinian universe that it's individual creatures that evolve over long periods of time through random mutations of their DNA because they're being nailed by all this harmful radiation, right? So it's mm -hmm. damaging these chromosomes and creating these wild mutants, and every once in a while you get, um, <laughs> you know, a superhero animal come through that can have more kids. Um, what you really see over um, in, the, in the fossil record is that the whole biosphere evolves <laughs> Um, in a direction over time and you have periods of acceleration and deceleration of the whole of the development of the whole thing we tend to call them mass extinctions again because we're stuck with this concept that everything in space is actually killing everything on the earth instead of participating in developing it um, so you have so you have the whole planet the whole biosphere developing uh, essentially in one direction as a biosphere so you have individuals in the biosphere, like, you know, we're individuals who live in society. Animals are little individuals in the biosphere. But they're acting with, as part of an entire system. So in that, I think you have, uh, you have an example of what you would consider, you can, you can talk about particles, the individuals, but also the wave phenomena, which is the continuum phenomena. So I think that... Um, in terms of developing not so much a solution but an understanding uh, of the paradoxes we see in the abiotic physics, I think you have to consider that you're actually seeing just a condensed version of actually like a biotic physics. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll have, a better, we'll have a fuller understanding of this and we'll develop things like the unified field theory and so forth only by looking back from uh, life. How life develops, how the biosphere develops. Mm -hmm. It seems like this point about life being not reducible to these abiotic, I mean, that seems to be the crucial starting point. Yeah, I mean, these guys can uh, back me up on this, but everywhere we're looking now, there are a lot of people with really good ideas who are looking at, um, you know, some of the, looking at the things that we're looking at, like Gervich radiation, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you can measure you can, uh, you can determine the wavelengths of light that's being transmitted between cells uh, in periods of mitosis and development. Um, <clears throat> most of these guys that we're looking at, they're investigating these very interesting phenomena, but they're starting from the standpoint that, um, a mechanistic standpoint essentially, that, or I mean, you know, there's this, there's this fight that goes back almost 100 years that you have the guys who think that there's got to be some kind of mechanism, some kind of abiotic mechanism that's determining the development of life, and we just don't know all the aspects of it yet. You know, there's this radiative aspect that people just don't want to look at, but it's still abiotic. Mm -hmm. but then there's the other side, the vitalist standpoint, which says that there is another aspect that we don't know about, and we can't know about. So, you know, you're kind of stuck there. You can go into mysticism or something like that. But a, a better standpoint is to start from the other direction and say that the so-called abiotic phenomena that you measure in the laboratory uh, is a lower phenomenon than life and that life itself, the investigation of life itself, mm. will give you a new conception of things like matter, what, what matter is. Vernadsky was very clear that um, mm. uh, you have these various phases of uh, space, of space-time that in the abiotic you have crystal structure, which represent, which is space, is space-time, in the abiotic. But in the biotic you have very detailed structure, which um, it's been said that the, the density of proteins and other 
uh, like organic molecules inside of a cell is as dense as crystal structure. So here you're looking at uh, the space time of living process. And for Natsuki it was clear that it's a, it's a hierarchy also, that you go from the top down and, uh, and matter is going to function in either domain differently. Hmm. But I was saying, but yeah, that, that's perfect. And it's worth drawing that out. I mean, what you're describing, mm-hmm. these people who have these interesting phenomena, mm-hmm. and it really, it's important to make the point to what extent they're crippled. I mean, it's mm-hmm. funny, because on a political level... And it's this not is, that they're bad or they're evil. They just, they're, they're destroying their ability to operate. Right. I mean, because on, on a political level, this is clear. If you look at what, I mean, look at what I mean, in George Orwell, look at 1984, look at uh, Huxley's 1984 Revisited, is a, a look at the British policy they were talking about. I mean, think about what what is what's new speak. What it is, I mean, the, how do you prevent the most effective way to prevent a thought crime was to make people incapable of expressing the thought you don't want them to have. Mm-hmm. If you destroy the language, the concepts that were threatening to you are eliminated because they don't have an ability to even state them. And you get the same thing. You've got all mm-hmm. these incredible concepts that exist in the phenomena they're looking at that are uniquely biological and on a higher level things that are uniquely cognitive hmm. that are real phenomena that are that are that are observable that have an, a, a very clear empirical existence but then the language that you have to be able to discuss them your mathematical mm-hmm. language your your conceptual language is drawn from a phase space where those phenomena don't exist where you've ruled them out and so as a result you can't you're not capable of addressing the concept directly hmm. And it's very important that you get these people who are, you know, brilliant experimentalists, brilliant at sort of working at, at drawing out the phenomena they're looking at. But then they kill it by speaking about it, hmm. by attempting to model it mathematically, by attempting to, to, to even explain what's happening. Because they're being, they've been drilled, they've been abused to the point that they, they feel like all these things have to be reduced to discussion in terms of, in terms of, the terminology that's only applicable, barely applicable, in the abiotic physics. Mm-hmm. And even there, as you mentioned, it's fall, it falls apart as soon as you hit questions of wave-particle duality. As soon as you hit the places where cognition needs to be taken into account in the physics, the whole thing melts down. Mm-hmm. If you try to take the, the, the theorem lattice of abiotic physics to its limits, it breaks down internally because it's part of the same universe that contains biological and cognitive phenomena. Mm-hmm. And so again, like the 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 need, you know, what you're pointing out is really draws out the need to develop a language that's different than the one we're given to operate with. And I think it's important to just point out that um, in Shelley's uh, defense of poetry, um, he does have this. The end of it, he ends up saying, uh, in revolutionary periods, you have an increased ability to impart and receive profound concepts. But earlier on, he says clearly that the science has essentially outrun its ability to discuss. Mm-hmm what the experimental results are apparently showing because mm. the poetry has broken down. Mm-hmm. And so in order to make further breakthroughs that the experimental work in science is implying, you have to essentially develop the language through poetry and other types of uh, classical modes of communication. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, which is, yeah, which is exactly the point that we're at right now. Right. That's, sort of, that's exactly what's required. There's, there's no there's no possibility of further progress without that. Mm-hmm. And right now, with the work we've done so far, with sort of the combined set of, of the recent research we've put together out of the basement, I think we're on, the, we're on the verge of being able to assemble that kind of, you know, that kind of uh, philological breakthrough, that kind of, that kind of mm-hmm. breakthrough in language. Mm-hmm. So I know this is something you've been discussing recently, I think you're working on, uh, is the question of language and time specifically and needing to this being one of these limiting concepts that science has is this preconceived idea of an absolute time in which all these different processes exist. Mm-hmm. But I know one of the things that you've been looking at is getting away from that idea and investigating from the standpoint of intrinsic times, I think you've been calling it. Which is, I mean, it's, a, it's an important thing. I mean, that's kind of, because you do want to say, well, what sorts of times, what sort of time, and we'll find that it's times, <laughs> Uh, are characteristic of biological processes and cognitive processes. Uh, the difficulty is the tendency is always to attempt to project anything that pertains to time, which is really your, your actions, your different types of change, to project them onto the same timeline. Uh, you can liken it to 
the way you take a, a, a musical composition and you project it onto a sheet of paper. You project it onto something that looks linear in time. It's in fact linear in space. It's on the sheet of paper. Uh, but that's the fact that it can be projected there does not tell you anything about what the internal relations are. Mm-hmm. Because as you, as you actually unfold the thing, I mean, to begin with, if it's an actual idea, if it's worth listening to, it was something that existed in the mind of the composer as a single idea. Just like any sentence worth listening to exists in the mind of the speaker as a single idea. If it exists as a series of separate words, you're not going to, you shouldn't expect much from the sentence. And the same thing, you shouldn't expect much from any other composition that exists in that way. It has its own intrinsic space to it. There's an intrinsic space, there's an intrinsic time where some areas which seem to be completely distant in the composition are much closer in terms of the phase space where the, where the composition exists. And you get that when you listen to it. You get, you get when you, 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 you hear certain repeats, you hear certain themes reintroduced, you realize that the, your mind builds a closeness between different areas in the, in the piece. It has an innate set of geometric relationships that are different than the way it's laid out. That almost, in a sense, nothing to do except distantly with the way it's laid out on paper. The question is, if you can start to approach time in that way as having this intrinsic character, what do you use first to break the, the, this timeline idea, this idea of a, of a simple extended geometric time, to break it in yourself, but then to draw from the phenomena the, the time where they exist? So you're looking for things that are indicative of this sort of thing. And in biology, there's a lot. There's a lot that Vernadsky himself looked at, which you see expressed in uh, what we would call the, the anti-entropic development of not just species, or not just a, a, you know, a single organism grows, develops. But then if you look at the passage of generations, what well, you're mentioning, the, the evolution of the organism in the whole biosphere, you see a certain cyclical character you see an upwards development. You see, there's a, you see there's a qualitative character of the time that's capable of representation. When you really push it, you start to see that you've got distinct times side by side. Again, this heterogeneous notion of it. Mm. Uh, but which is something that wants to be mapped out. A lot of the language to do that, I think, is going to come from looking at the unique way that time exists in cognition, which is going to come, comes up a lot as we just discussed in composition, questions of musical, literary, other types of composition that include change and in action as part of them. You see that the way they use time is, is necessarily nonlinear. Uh, but then, yeah, some studies of early language, looking at the way, uh, I mean, typically, there's a tendency to reduce the way time is expressed in language to questions of tense. Uh, to sort of pre-existing structures, and this you get with all the kind of the creepy modern linguistic stuff, which is trying to uh, reduce the language to some set of, of universal functions. When if you really look at the evolution of language, and you look at what's required in, in, in modern languages even, but it's more explicit in earlier languages, to discuss time as it's actually experienced by the human individual, you get a very complex set of things that, that, are, that are very distant from, from any timeline interpretation of tense. You require moods mm. like the subjunctive. You require uh, uh, a concept of aspect, which is explicitly discussing the intrinsic character of time. And those are more important for the human individual, for human communication, because the fact that those are more important in, for us to communicate in language than issues of tense really demonstrates it as actual ontological as concepts that actually exist, they're more important for us to deal with than, than, than things that have this sort of timeline relationship. And so, yeah, a still waiting project to be done that we'll be working on is going to be to map that out in some, in some, some more detail, to map out what exactly what kind of concepts were required to be created by poets, what do they have to develop in order to enable the human species to function in the universe that it lives in. And so that's going to be a, that'll be an important study. And drawing that out more explicitly than it has been in the past mm-hmm. is going to be is going to be one of the things on our uh, on our plate. Okay. And probably it's good for today. Uh, if people haven't seen the papers yet, all three uh, Peter Oyong and Sky have papers on the on the Larouche Pack website discussing more in depth some of the material we've been discussing today. And there will be more coming, including more of these discussions. So with that, 
thank you guys for a fun discussion. Thank you. Look forward to more. All right. Thanks, Ben.